All right, I think we are live now. Welcome everybody uh, to the uh, emerging revolutionary war, uh, uh, rev war revelry here tonight, uh, revolutionary war happy hour, where we're going to be talking about uh, uh, militia and continentals and uh, some of these army units uh, during the revolutionary war. We all have our uh, drinks with us here. Uh, of course, I have uh, the uh, oldest beer in America, Yingling. I'm sure some Rev War veterans might have had one of these uh, in the 19th century. Um, but uh, we got a great uh, group of historians here to talk a little bit about uh, these different topics. Um, so I'm going to go through and introduce them. Uh, we got Billy Griffith here, uh, one of the Emerging Early Shore historians. Uh, he's a licensed guide at Gettysburg uh, Battlefield and uh, for the Rev War, he's actually uh, just finished writing a book about the Battle of Monmouth uh, that's going to be coming out uh, shortly this summer. Uh, we got Travis Shaw. He's with the uh, Mosby Heritage Area um, and uh, also does living history uh, with uh, Queens Rangers and uh, knows a lot about the Revolutionary War. We also got uh, Mark Wilcox, uh, native of Richmond, Virginia, um, and uh, historian who's uh, working on a book about the uh, Battle of Camden uh, down in South Carolina. You got to go on a nice trip down there about a year and a half ago. And uh, we also got joining us uh, today, Gabe Neville, uh, who's uh, the, he runs the 8th Virginia blog. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. It's very good. Um, and uh, a researcher based here in Virginia as well. Um, but, uh, so we're going to talk about, uh, militia and continentals, you know, these kind of terms get thrown out all around a lot, uh, when people are reading about the revolutionary war. So let's kind of, uh, break it down a little bit. So I'm going to toss it off to, uh, Mark Wilcox first, uh, to tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what the militia is. Well, think about the national guard today. These were pretty much the origins of those, uh, those organizations, but a militia, I mean, it really for England goes back to probably the 11th century when someone would, you'd be mandated to, to have a firearm to be able to come to the defense of your community or whatnot. And a, a, a militia really is an auxiliary uh, for the regular army. So it's, it's kind of a parallel type of, of military organization that will come out. These are citizen soldiers. They're not professional soldiers. Um, they do drill maybe once a month but especially here in the colonies, especially out in the, in the frontier, a lot of those muster days are really just a good chance to get together with uh, your friends and neighbors and things like that, and maybe hoist a tanker or two. And, um, but they, they did learn to march and learn to drill. Um, but these are citizen soldiers who are expected to come out in times of emergency, um, times of uh, when there's great danger, especially on the frontier if there's uh, attacks by Native Americans. And uh, really out on the frontier, it's, uh, it, it's really survival. It's not just to bring your body to, to, um, to offset some type of emergency. You know, during a Native American race, it's life or death. And uh, so settlers had to band together. Um, but, you know, these, the militia groups are not the hard-bitten continentals. And I'm not going to get into... <clears throat> their training, because I know one of you guys are going to be doing that. Um, but uh, these are citizen soldiers in their own, they usually wear uh, their own clothing. There are some militia units that were very, very well trained, uh, had uniforms, looked great, marched very, very well. But by and large, you know, militia units in their own, uh, in their own homespun, lots of times in their own clothing, with their own weapons, you know, maybe equipment that's been battered things that go back to the old French wars, you know, uh, Spanish muskets and French muskets and things like that. So not a lot of uniform there. Um, but of course, during the Revolutionary War, the American militia had the reputation of not being very reliable. And certainly there are cases where the exact opposite was, uh, was the truth. Um, but by and large, the militia really didn't have uh, the greatest reputation. And you used a term that I'm really, really glad you used, and that is mandated. Um, I think it's important to remember in the 18th century, you know, a militia is embodied by some part of the government. You know, these militias are organized by the colonial government or later on by the state governments. Um, you know, we're not necessarily talking about just a group of guys who want to hang out and 
practice being soldiers. Um, you know, this is an important part of the colonial government and colonial defense. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. And it, I think it's also important to think that, uh, you know, they reported to the royal government at that time or uh, yeah. create a real, you know, tension when they had to decide, uh, you know, when all these new governments are being uh, incorporated, you know, they're still supposed to be reporting to, uh, you know, the defense of the royal governor or whatever. Of course, that's going to change. But. And one last thing to add to that, who is the typical militia soldier, at least on the eve of the American Revolution? It's someone who's between the ages of 16 and 60. Right. Uh, and they're usually free white landowners. OK, so this is more of a middle class military organization because they don't usually have to do much fighting. Um, but we'll see that that the definition of who was a militiaman will kind of stretch as the Revolutionary War approaches, because prior to that, uh, obviously, indentured servants are not allowed. Uh, Native Americans, as well as uh, blacks, too, are not allowed to fight within the militia. But that's going to change uh, as the emergency was, of the war will make it necessary. Yeah, I mean, if you. Oh, sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, well, why don't you speak to what you were just going to say? I was going to say, you know, if you, you look at a lot of militia books, um, you know, again, this is a required service. So like you see a lot of people like getting fined for not showing up or like showing up without guns and things like that. Um, and you mentioned, you know, especially in a lot of cases, this is almost a social thing. You know, they're getting together, they're drinking, they're hanging out. Um, you know, obviously it becomes deadly serious as the revolution gets closer and closer, um, but, and you know, uh, well, I, was gonna say, uh, I think one of the militia's uh, finest hours uh, is uh, the very first battle of the, the whole war at Lexington Concord. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, that was entirely uh, uh, a militia operation. Um, but uh, I think that the militia kind of, you know, soon grows this aura around it as uh, the be all and end all of American defense. Um, and uh, that was clearly not the case. Um, and very early in the war, they're gonna start, uh, the Continental Congress is going to form an army uh, that became known as the Continental Army. And uh, we're gonna have, uh, they're gonna raise troops uh, to fight and defend uh, the new states of America. So uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Gabe at this point, if you want to, uh, well, first tell me what you're drinking and uh, then you <laughs> Okay, so I've got, I've got two bottles here, one I'm drinking and one I'm not. So th this is, this is a Bowman Brothers bourbon. It's a Virginia bourbon. It's uh, distilled in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, and it's named after uh, four brothers who were known as the four centaurs of Cedar Creek. Uh, they were from the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, Abraham Bowman was the colonel of the 8th Virginia Regiment, which I write about, and his three brothers were uh, very important militia uh, officers, uh, particularly in Kentucky and uh, under George Rogers Clark. Um, th this, is, this is the premium blend. This is the Abraham Bowman. This is really hard to get. It's not open. I'm saving this for a special occasion, but I thought I'd let you see it. And that's named after the 8th Virginia guy? Yeah, that, he was the colonel of the 8th Virginia Regiment. Yeah, so I, I keep hoping that they're going to send me free whiskey. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe somebody's watching. So, so Continental soldiers are, they're the soldiers that uh, the revolutionary leaders did not want to have, but soon found uh, necessary. And... Uh, we, any of us could talk at length about this, but it goes back to the Stuart monarchy when the Stuart kings used standing professional permanent armies to uh, su suppress the rights of Englishmen. Uh, this is what led to the Glorious Revolution, so-called in, in Britain. Um, uh, and uh, the Americans, who didn't think of themselves as Americans yet at the start of the war, uh, they had inherited this anti-Stuart, anti-tyranny view that we should not have standing armies at all, that it is an inherent threat to liberty, right? Um, and uh, we may get into this a little bit later, but during the uh, French and Indian War era, uh, uh, American leaders saw a couple of examples of uh, either uh, regular soldiers not doing so well, as happened under Braddock, Right, that was seen as a, a proof that the redcoats were vulnerable, uh, and uh, 
the lesser known siege of Louisburg up in Canada, uh, when the, uh, uh, I think it was, it may have just been Massachusetts militia, but it may have been broader New England militia. Uh, they successfully laid siege to a very important French fort uh, with uh, British naval support. But as I recall, they were the only infantry involved. Uh, and that in New England was seen as proof that uh, uh, militiamen could, could beat a professional army. Uh, when the revolution started, um, uh, the, uh, most of the founders thought that uh, uh, citizen warriors were the way to go, that we could beat the Redcoats without a standing army of professionals. Um, it looked that way for much of the first year. Uh, Lexington conquered Bunker Hill, um, the Battle of Great Bridge in Virginia. Um, there were a lot of early uh, uh, engagements in which uh, you know, it looked like we could prevail without a standing army. Um, but when push came to shove, it came, became pretty clear that a lot of militia were not that well trained. Uh, they uh, were eager to get back home and finish with the harvest or what have you. Absolutely. Uh, and they could not function as a full-time professional army the way we needed to win the war. Uh, so slowly, um, the individual colonies, they were still colonies at the beginning, or provinces, uh, began to form uh, standing regiments. Uh, in Virginia, where I focus most of my attention, you had the 1st Virginia Regiment, the 2nd Virginia Regiment. These were provincial regiments, so they're not continental yet. Uh, Patrick Henry was the colonel of the 1st. Uh, uh, William Woodford, right, was the uh, colonel of the 2nd. Uh, but these are, these are provincial regiments uh, with one year terms of service. Uh, when George Washington is made commander in chief of the new Continental Army, uh, a lot of those, uh, uh, the, the ar rabble army around Boston, they were turned into uh, regiments and they were numbered uh, one through how many, how, how many guys, I can't remember. But if, if you hear like the first or second or third or fourth Continental Regiment, you know it's a New England regiment because it, all of the Southern states and mid-Atlantic states, uh, well, maybe that's not so true for mid-Atlantic, but the Southern states like Virginia, they started their own regiments. Uh, so the, the Virginia regiments were always known as the third or the fourth or the fifth Virginia regiment. Uh, but in New England, they were uh, continental regiments. But as, as the war progressed through 75 and then to 76, Virginia turned its regiments into continental regiments. And then now we have a 13 colony continental army. But it, it sort of it began in the north and moved south. Um, uh, they started out with short enlistments, and they got longer and longer through the war until they were a, a real professional army trained by Baron Destoyben at uh, Valley Forge, uh, and met many of them seasoned veterans if, as time went on. And these were and and they were paid. These are paid soldiers. That... Well, they were they were supposed to be paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point. Uh... Yeah. Because the, the states themselves are actually competing to get these recruits from uh, Continental Service. So at one point, I think 1778 or so, like 100 acres is actually evolved or um, promised to any man who uh, will enlist with the Continentals. So right. there's definitely a lot of incentive because a lot of the men who are fighting with the Continental Army, they're really from the lower dregs of society. For them, they aren't just fighting for America. They're fighting for a better life for themselves, too. This is the yeah. promise of a fortune to come with this new country. And that while they are fighting, they're also receiving food, drink every day, as well as shelter. And again, the promise of being paid too. That's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. You look at the men who make up the Continental Army, you're looking at like landless tenant farmers, you're looking at out of work artisans, you're looking at immigrants, um, you're looking at um, surprisingly high number of African-Americans. You know, this is the last time the army's integrated until the 1940s, so or 50s, Truman administration. Um, it really isn't, you know, when we think of who's in the militia versus who's in the Continental Army, it's a very different rung of society. Now these, uh, these Continental soldiers, like I said, they're, they become better trained, but I think it's, you know, I think Washington and many of the officers placed a lot more trust in the Continental regiments than they did in the militias in, uh, in, in winning a battle. Um, but where do you think he got that notion from? 
Yeah, so it, so what, uh, some of the best examples of that are the Philadelphia campaign. If you look at uh, Brandywine or Germantown, Washington has a lot of militia, but he basically says, okay, you guys just stay out of the way, right? He moves them way off to one flank or at Germantown, both flanks, basically hoping that they'll just stay out of the way and not cause trouble, right? Uh, if they perform, uh, they'll, they'll pierce through some, some uh, uh, British pickets, and, and uh, join the flanking that uh, his, his professionals are gonna do. Um, it's not until later in the war, uh, most notably at Cowpens, and I'll, I'm sure somebody here is, is primed to tell the story, uh, where we see the real, the, the wise and useful and effective way to really use militia. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll let our moderator decide who gets to tell that story. Any takers? I mean, I think it, I, all right, Mark, you want to go ahead and do it? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, of all the battlefields I've ever walked, Calpens is absolutely my, my favorite. And it took somebody like Daniel Morgan to understand how to properly use the militia. Uh, at, you know, we're studying the Battle of Camden when Horatio Gates sticks North Carolina and Virginia militiamen right on his main battle line. And the Virginian didn't have a good showing and most of North Carolinian uh, North Carolinians didn't either although some did stand and fight um, but you know it's a few months later and it's um, Green, uh, Daniel Morgan is separated from Nathaniel Green who's who's now the commander in the south uh, for the Continental Army and uh, looking for forage and it's Benastro Tarleton who was on his tail with his legion um, who is known for these quick strikes and he's brutal and so forth and I just love what Morgan did. He just used those strengths of Tarleton against him. But, you know, lining up with, with a marsh on one side, a river on the other side, right at the Calpins, an open area in, in, uh, in South Carolina where drovers would bring their, their livestock to fatten them up on the way to market. And, um, you know, big hardwood trees and so forth, open spaces. And, you know, Morgan knows the militia are not going to be able to stand a bayonet assault, because it's, think about it, when you're not a trained soldier and you see the best army in the world coming towards you with their, with their muskets a slant and bayonets gleaming in the sun and they're coming right at you, um, you're probably not gonna be there when they get there. I probably wouldn't. Um, get off a couple of shots. You know, Morgan sticks to, you know, Georgia and Carolina sharpshooters, you know, who emptied about 15 saddles of the uh, of British Dragoons when they're on their, their initial charge. The main line of militia on the on the crest of the hill get off get off two three shots and then fall back. That's it, and that plays right into what the British have seen with militia. They're not going to stand. Tarleton thinks they're running, so the you know the the the, the British surge forward, and when they get over the crest of the hill, who do they find? They find Maryland Continentals. They find uh, Virginia militia with Continental training. And they're standing firm. And, uh, but understanding the militia, knowing they can't stand up you know, in, in a line of battle, but using their strengths, get off a few shots, and then you're free. And uh, you know, I don't know. I think that's probably, in my opinion, that's the greatest victory the Continental Army achieved in the war. Yeah, I, I think there, there does need to be, you know, Dan Morgan, I think something to the effect of, uh, you know, if the militia fight, you'll win. Um, you know, it, it required this kind of side-by-side uh, -side working of the Continentals with the militia. And the militia plays a big role. Uh, behind me, I got the uh, Battle of Trenton going on here, uh, which at this point, which is really one of the, you know, the nadir of the, uh, the whole revolution, it looked like the whole thing was over. Washington only had a few thousand Continentals with him, pretty much – you know, everybody else had, had left. He only had a few thousand men and uh, crossed the Delaware River, attacked Trenton with his Continentals. Uh, and then uh, the militias then rally. And the militias also were important in uh, New Jersey. I see uh, Jason Wickerstee is on uh, and talking about the Jersey militia. They're going to play, uh, play an important role in, uh, in, in constantly harassing uh, British regulars throughout. Not just, I mean, that's in New Jersey, but really wherever the British army goes in America, they're going to meet resistance constantly uh, from militias. Um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think that's, I think that kind of has become the American myth of the uh, the militia being, they won the war by hiding behind trees and sniping at 
British regulars who are, you know, stupidly walking through the woods with their bright red coats. Um, I think you needed this continental contingent to hold out uh, throughout, you know, through stay through places like Valley Forge or Morristown uh, to, to represent uh, that um, uh, opposition to, to British rule in America. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big values of the militia is just in their sheer numbers. Um, you have a situation like New Jersey that I guess Jason brought up, the Forge Wars in New Jersey, where, you know, any time a British outpost is isolated, any time a British Forge patrol is going out, they're going to be constantly worried about attacks. And these attacks might not cause that many casualties, but the constant attrition of just, you know, any time they leave the safety of British lines, they may be under attack. That is going to slowly wear down the British Army in, in New Jersey and in other places. We see it in the South, um, you know, once after the battles of Calpens, after the battles of Guilford, um, when, when, you know, the British Army, Cornwallis basically leaves the Carolinas, he leaves these isolated pockets that just get kind of gradually overwhelmed by the sheer number of Southern militia that come out. Um, you know, and these guys are suppressing loyalists. They're preventing British from gathering supplies. Um, they're doing all the kind of behind the scenes work while the Continental Army is out there doing the heavy fighting. And I think it's important, the Continental Army, when they can score victories uh, and when they, I mean, the morale factor is very important because people are going to, the militias are going to rally to wherever, uh, you know, it looks like who's going to be winning. Um, I that's think that's a great. That's a great point, though. I mean, when the militia are really fighting on their home ground, and we mentioned uh, the Lexington militia, we we we, we talk we talk about the Lexington alarm. We've talked about the New England militia all at, at Lexington and Concord. I mean, these guys were defending their home turf, and they swarmed and and uh, and made a stand. And I think also at you know at uh, the strategy of the Americans at, at Saratoga, as the American army retreating, uh, heading south. Um, they're getting stronger. They're adding more and more militia units because the, con the armies are coming into, you know, the home turf or a lot of these, these units. And the American army is getting stronger and the British army is getting weaker and their supply line is about to snap. It's a, it was a great strategy. And I think this ties directly into my next question, which is going to be because this is so important to rally the militias is the British are looking for places where they think that people will come to their side. Uh, and that brings in the whole, you know, <laughs> aspect of the revolution. Oh, the will of the wisp. And, and, yeah, where do loyalists, uh, people who you know, don't believe in this new uh, uh, continental idea, how, how are they going to, uh, uh, how are they going to make their way through this maze? Uh, so I'll turn it over to Travis and see, uh, he knows a lot about the, uh, the loyalists, uh, especially in Virginia here, so. Sure, um, so, you know, maybe about 40 to 50,000 Americans will actually take up arms against the revolution. They'll take up arms for the crown. Um, and they are gonna come from all walks of life, kind of all backgrounds. Um, and they're gonna be used in a wide spectrum of ways. You know, we've talked about militias and continental soldiers. Um, you're going to have basically loyalist versions of that. You are going to have loyalist militias. Again, it's going to be places where the British establish political control. New York, um, around New York after the British take it, they probably have about five to 7,000 militia that they raise in New York. They're going to raise militias in the Carolinas um, later on in the war. Um, they're also going to have um, what's known as the Provincial Corps, and that is essentially kind of the loyalist counterparts of the Continental Army. These are troops that are enlisted for the duration of the war, typically. They're gonna be armed, equipped, paid the same as regular British soldiers. Um, the only difference is they're raised from the Americas. They're raised at the, basically at the command of the commander in chief in America. Um, and they're gonna act as more or less regular troops. Um, and kind of in between these two, we do have various groups of like volunteer corps that may or may not be paid. They're kind of raised temporarily. God knows who's commanding them, um, depends on a case by case basis. Um, but the, uh, I would say when we talk about the loyalist experience militarily in the Revolutionary War, um, most of the focus is going to fall on that provincial corps, um, which again is going to number um, actual provincial provincials as opposed to militia and stuff, like 20,000, 25,000, maybe 30,000 men. Um, and 
several of those units, five of them will actually be taken on to the British regular army establishment, um, which means that, you know, they're going to stick around after the war ends, their officers are going to continue to get half pay and things like that. Um, and that really represents the cream of the crop when it comes to loyalists. Um, we're talking the Queen's Rangers, um, which becomes the first American regiment, the cavalry of the British Legion, um, the Royal New York Regiment, the Volunteers of Ireland, like these guys um, really, I would say, if we're talking battlefield experience, equip themselves as well as any other unit in the war. Um, they absolutely do some hard fighting. Um, but, you know, then on the other hand, you have, you know, some of these loyalist militias that come and go just the same way that their patriot counterparts did. Um, so it's, it really is almost a mirror image of the, the American or Patriot experience, whatever we want to call it, the Whig experience of the Revolutionary War. Yeah, well, this was central to the British strategy, wasn't it? Right. I mean, they they assumed that in most places the the uh, radical Whig uh, revolutionary element was 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 a thin veneer uh, with a, a deep base of loyalist sentiment underneath that just wasn't wasn't militant. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we always hear about this. Is, yeah. yeah, why they head south in, in 1780, which I would argue is way too late to be doing that. Um, I mean, we, we see a very, uh, there's a lot of kind of no man's land in the Revolutionary War. You look at a place like New Jersey, or you look at a place like the Pennsylvania frontier, or even the Carolinas, where when the British army comes through, there's a lot of support at least on the surface for the British. When the American army comes through, the opposite is true. You know, the people are coming out in support of them. Um, I don't think the the loyalist support had the depth that, that a lot of British officers expected to find, at least in certain areas. Yeah. Um, certainly not by the later 1780, 1781. Maybe if they had been more proactive in the earlier stages of the war, that might've been the case, but um, the British definitely suffer from kind of a very like roller coaster. Uh, you know, one, on one hand, they're turning around, they're being very, very harsh to the, the civilian population. They're being, you know, brutal or, or restrictive to the civilian population. And then they do the opposite. They let up and they, you know, maybe they're a little too lenient on the population. There was never kind of a coherent strategy, I think. Um, at least in terms of winning the, the hearts and minds of the American population. It was so, always so one extreme or the other. So on this, I've heard it asserted that Kings Mountain is the true turning point in the revolution because it was at that point that loyalists or would-be loyalist uh, uh, militia, would-be loyalist regulars uh, realized, you know what, it doesn't pay to stand up and, and support the king. What do you think of that? I I don't know if I would agree with that. Um, I think that's I think that might be a bit of an overstatement. I mean, Kings Mountain is huge. Don't get me wrong. Kings Mountain is a huge turning point in the war as far as really clearing the Carolinas of of British support. You know, like you said, it, it convinces a lot of would-be loyalists to maybe it's better to keep their heads down. Um, but you still have big pockets of loyalist support, um, particularly in New York, Pennsylvania. Um, where people are still more than willing to, to come out and fight. And I mean, even after King's Mountain, it's not a done deal. Um, you know, militarily speaking, um, really until I'd argue Yorktown, you know. Um, yeah. It's, and I think that actually goes back, speaking to what Mark was talking about with the militia, it's very important role of the militia, um, you know, in a situation like King of Mountain, where you have loyalist militia versus patriot militia, um, after the victory there, those, that patriot militia just goes through the Carolinas and they exact retribution on anyone suspected of loyalism. And I think that, I mean, if we're talking about a turning point that comes out of King's Mountain, it's, it's the backlash after King's Mountain that really convinces many of these people to stay home. Yeah, and I think it's how uh, personal it was uh, between groups and, you know, ideology sometimes didn't play as big a role as, uh, you know, exacting revenge and settling scores and things like that. So it got pretty brutal in a lot of places as well. 
but yeah, no, I think, I think battlefield victories uh, where, you know, regulars are able to, to, to make victories are going to play big roles in, um, in, in the later thing, which is interesting. Cause like I said, uh, in, in mythology, I feel like, you know, people don't really understand, you know, the fact that there was a regular continental army and how important it was uh, that they stay in the field. And I think that's why places like Valley Forge and with the winter encampments are important because the, the militia were able to go home. Um, and it was really the, uh, the regulars who had to stick it out through. through thick and, and that's what was, that was what was important to the war. It was Washington didn't have to win. He just needed to, to outlast the British until the folks at home got tired of it. It's what the Confederacy was hoping for in late 1864. They're waiting for the people of the North to start losing interest in the war. And, uh, and, and you know, that's what happens in the revolution. Washington outlasts uh, the British. But you know, we were talking about Kings Mountain and that's one of my favorite stories too, because I love the fact that, you know, the, the big lesson for Kings Mountain for me is never ever threaten people from East Tennessee. <laughs> they will march back over the mountains and take care of you pretty quickly. Um, well, and, and, right. and then they just, and then they, they, they got the retribution and then they went home. They did the job. Well, it's, it's also a battle that's entirely fought among Americans. I, I think Absolutely. people realize that too, that, you know, what, Ferguson was the only, you know, the only, uh, you know, really British soldier. Yeah. Right. I think people usually, you know, you, people who know about the war in the South usually have seen the Patriot and you see in there, Tavington, who's supposed to be like Tarleton. Uh, people don't realize that that, that is uh, the Tarleton's Legion. Yeah, we're we're Americans. Americans. Yeah, <laughs> like and it's kind of mind blowing when you think about it that you know one of the the, the most feared British uh, units uh, were made up of loyalists. Um, yeah. So definitely, but you know why is their story not told? Well, what happened to the loyalists afterwards? <laughs> A lot of them become Canadian. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, I mean it's. Um, I mean, I, I always approach it from the, the idea that the, this is a civil war. I mean, you look at what's going on in the Carolinas, you look at the Pennsylvania frontier, the New York frontier, you look at New Jersey, that's a full blown civil war. In a lot of these cases, there's not a British, you know, the, the British involvement or German involvement is very small. We're, we're talking about Americans fighting Americans um, and, and it gets very personal. Um, I don't know how much ideology really even plays into it. In a lot of cases, I think this is, a lot of old grudges get settled in the Carolinas in 17. Absolutely, especially have nothing to do with the war. Especially South Carolina, right there. Yeah. It, it absolutely was a civil war. A lot of a lot of old grudges getting settled. Absolutely. All right, let's do something fun here. We're gonna go around, uh, and uh, I want everybody to tell me what their favorite. You know, you talked about militia, Continentals, loyalists. What's your favorite unit in the war, and uh, and why? Uh, so I'm gonna start with Gabe because I kind of have a feeling I know what he's gonna say. But <laughs> how much time do I get? <laughs> so thanks for letting me go first. Uh, so it's it's the Eighth Virginia uh, uh, Continental Regiment. Uh, I blog on it, so this is a slam dunk for me. Uh, the reason is a I've spent a lot of time looking at it, uh, but. Um, the Shenandoah Valley, where the 8th was primarily raised, uh, also up to Pittsburgh, um, they represent what most of us think of as uh, frontiersmen, right? So a lot of the stuff that uh, we think of in terms of the frontier, the Oregon Trail, uh, fringed hunting shirts, long rifles, dueling, Indian fighting, uh, whiskey, you know, all of this stuff has its origins in uh, the early, uh, late colonial, early national frontier. That, that's sort of the Shenandoah Valley and the areas just beyond that, right? So like Hampshire County, West Virginia, Pittsburgh. Um, so they represent the aspirations that I think Billy was talking about when we first started, right? You had a lot of kind of middle-class, lower middle-class immigrant folks uh, who wanted land. Right, land was how you prosper, and at least in Virginia, all the land was already taken. Right, uh, you know George Washington and George Mason already owned it all. Right, in, in gigantic plots, uh, unlike Pennsylvania, where William Penn gave it out in 180 acre plots to anybody who asked. So, for a Virginian to prosper, he had to go west, 
right? Uh, and earlier on, that meant going to the Shenandoah Valley. But when that land was all taken up, that meant going to Kentucky, right? Or Ohio, both of which were Virginia at the time. But the proclamation line in 1863, which the king drew to prevent further Indian fighting, uh, proclaimed that you couldn't go any further west. Well, this is a problem. So um, I think the 8th Virginia guys and a lot of guys in the 12th Virginia and the 13th Virginia and other regiments, uh, they were really fighting to go west. They weren't interested in tea and taxes. I think they wanted to go west. Uh, and fighting the war was the way that they, they got to do that. Uh, so a lot of them spent more time fighting Indians than they spent fighting redcoats. Uh, it's a story that uh, doesn't get told a whole lot, but it, it is the origin of all of our frontier mythology from wagon trains and Conestoga wagons to uh, Pennsylvania long rifles and dueling, all that stuff. It's a great story. So sorry, sorry to run on, Mark. Oh, no, that's great. Uh, see, go, go to 8thVirginia.com. Yeah, <laughs> great. A lot of good research on there, uh, and uh, I see Derek Wall is watching from William and Mary. All right, and uh, he's a uh, he's a big fan of Woodstock as well, and uh, Woodstock, Virginia, uh, which was one of the areas where the Eighth Virginia mustered. Uh, if any of you know the the famous Peter Muhlenberg, uh, you know, time to pray and a time to fight. Uh, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to reenact that and uh, me and uh, Gabe are actually uh, working with the town of Woodstock to hopefully get some sort of nice little uh, living memorial uh, developed uh, to the 8th Virginia there in Woodstock. So uh, yeah. but follow Gabe at 8th Virginia Regiment. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, Mark Wilcox. You know, it's pretty hard to pick a favorite. You know, I've always, I've always been partial to uh, Daniel Morgan's rifle. Uh, brigade. I mean, that, they're just they're just uh, almost mythological in terms of what these guys could guys could do with an American long rifle. But I think if I had to pick, maybe not even a specific unit, but um, you know, Mordecai Guest's Second Maryland Brigade were some of the toughest combat troops that the Continental Army ever produced. And you think about the way these guys stood on Long Island, the way these guys stood at Camden, along with the first. Uh, Maryland, the the, uh, the Delaware Regiment as well. When the militia have, have fled the field, Horatio Gates has fled the field 180 miles in a couple of days. And and yet, you know, these Maryland troops are surrounded and they're just fighting almost to the last. I mean, these were, when I think about a hard-bitten Continental unit, I think about those Maryland troops. Yeah, no, and uh, you're right about that. And I think it's really interesting, too. You mentioned Dan Morgan's rifleman. Uh, you know, we tend to think of uh, the militia as being all riflemen, but that was a, a group of uh, Continentals that, uh, you know, obviously, yeah, uh, turned the tide at many, at a few different battlefields, but yeah, definitely at Saratoga. Especially Saratoga, you betcha. All right, uh, what about you, Travis? What you got? Oh man, there's a ton of Continental units yeah. I could pick from, um, but since I'm kind of representing the other side tonight, um, I'm going to go with, like I said, the Queens Rangers, um, you know, American Loyalist unit, um, one of those five units that's taken onto the British establishment for their, their combat service. Um, I think it's really easy to cast these guys as villains. You know, especially nowadays, um, anyone who's seen Turn knows that the Queens Rangers are the big bad guys in there. Um, but you know, we're losing sight. These were Americans. These were Americans who were fighting for their homes, fighting for their families, fighting for their way of life, just the same as the Americans that they faced on the other side of the field. Um, and as far as like cool combat stuff, the Queens Rangers, man, it's basically what we would call in, in modern terms, combined arms. They had mounted companies, they had riflemen, they had a Highland company, they had grenadiers, light infantry. Um, they really served as a self-contained kind of combined combat team. And pretty much every battle that they are ever involved in during the war, they equipped themselves incredibly well. Um, I mean, these guys were not cowards. Um, they fought hard. They fought hard at Brandywine, um, take second highest casualties of any British unit at Brandywine. Um, they fight hard at Monmouth. They fight hard all through New York, New Jersey, th fight hard all the way through Virginia to the very end. Um, really a remarkable group of men um, who are fascinating to study, so. And well represented Turn, I believe, right? What's that? They're well represented in the TV show Turn. 
We um, get a whole episode about everything that is incorrect about the Queens Rangers. On the <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want to take up too much time. So That's another episode. All right. What about you, Billy? Uh, yeah, talking about other turn loyalist units that were represented on the show. What about the American Legion? That's raised by uh, Brigadier General Benedict Arnold in Long Island uh, after he hops sides. Uh, that's a pretty successful unit. It's not obviously in service as long as the Queens Rangers, but uh, Mark Malloy definitely hates them since they burnt Richmond to the ground in 1780. Uh, but that's not my favorite unit. Um, just like with the American Civil War, my favorite unit is the 1st New Jersey Brigade. It has to be in the New Jersey Brigade as well uh, during the American Revolutionary War. Talked a lot about the militia and the Continentals tonight. Well, in New Jersey, uh, this brigade of New Jersey Continentals, the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th New Jersey under Brigadier General William Maxwell, known as uh, Scotch Willie because he had a fondness for drinking whiskey. Who doesn't? But um, they are actually fighting hand-in-hand -hand with the New Jersey militia uh, during the winter of 1777 after the Continentals and Americans do actually reclaim the state following Trenton and Princeton. They push the British all the way back towards Amboy and New Brunswick as well as during uh, the Monmouth campaign in 1778, um, as Henry Clinton's army is trying to get away from Philadelphia across New Jersey towards New York City, uh, they are harassing them along the entire path uh, back to that British stronghold. So uh, these men, really both of it, this is really one of the only instances, I think, during the war where you can see Continentals and militia fighting, do you do, uh, actually acting in the same capacity um, as a whole rather than working as individual groups. But the New Jersey Brigade, uh, they fight up in New York. Uh, they are the ones who actually help repair Fort Stanwix, which will eventually hold off a uh, British invasion into the Mohawk Valley during the Saratoga campaign. Uh, they fight at Monmouth. They're gonna be fighting in New York at Brandywine, Germantown. They fight up, some of them in Quebec with Benedict Arnold and Richard Montgomery. So they are really all over the place. Uh, and even one of the units in it, the second New Jersey, which was formed in 1776, the last men from it are actually furloughed in 1783. So they fought for the entire war. That's a good contender. I think for myself, I'm gonna have to go with uh, my own hometown unit here, of, uh, the Third Virginia Regiment. I think that they yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of them were raised uh, in the Northern Virginia area, and I live in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, one of our local heroes, Colonel John Fitzgerald, who served as a captain originally in the Third before being promoted onto Washington's staff. But Third uh, Virginia Regiment is just a fascinating regiment. You got some heavy hitters in it you got uh william washington who's uh george washington's uh distant cousin you also got uh uh james monroe uh who's just a young 18 year old boy uh who uh leaves william and mary to go fight in the war uh later becomes president uh you also got uh hugh mercer uh who served as a captain as well before being promoted and becoming general uh and then sacrificing his life at princeton but the third Virginia is going to be, you know, they go up to, to fight in the New York campaign. They're along the long retreat across New Jersey. They're at Trenton. You know, they're right at the, the vanguard there. Uh, they're also at Princeton um, and uh, those really important turning points, which you can read about in Victory or Death by myself. Uh, and then uh, they're also going to be, you know, they're going to stick with Washington uh, through they're at uh, Brandywine. They're, you know, and some of the heaviest fighting at Birmingham Hill. Uh, they're going to uh, fight also at Germantown, and then they're going to, you know, spend the winter at Valley Forge, where a lot of them sacrificed. Uh, and then uh, in uh, 1780, they're going to be sent down with the whole Virginia line down to South Carolina, uh, down to Charleston, which, think about it, marched overland down to South Carolina uh, and got there just in time uh, for the news to be tightened by the British, and they all get captured. Uh, and many of them end up on prison ships out in Charleston Harbor, many of them sacrificed as well. So uh, it was a unit that uh, that fought bravely and was everywhere from New Jersey all the way down to South Carolina. So I always, whenever I can find an opportunity to research more about the third Virginia, I think, and really, you know, into, you know, the Virginia line altogether is, you know, Virginians everywhere uh, throughout the war. So it's fascinating to me to, to study about that and places, people who called these places home, so. All right. Well, uh, any uh, anybody have any final thoughts uh, to conclude this uh, happy hour? Yeah, I've, I've got one. So we've been talking about Continentals and militia. 
we yeah. should probably note that there are other kinds of troops in the war. Right? Ah, so yeah. in, in, in Virginia, again, where you know I, I, I focus, the first kinds of troops you see are these volunteer companies, right? So there or or gentlemen companies, sometimes they're called, uh, or independent companies. These are grassroots companies of uh, usually local elite men. Um, uh, they are most best known for uh, responding to the Virginia powder alarm when uh, Patrick Henry almost did what uh, also happened in, in Concord, right? Um, uh, they were replaced, as I understand it, by uh, Minutemen. Virginia had Minutemen too. It, it, it didn't go well. Uh, the, the, the most famous unit of Virginia Minutemen is the Culpeper Minutemen, uh, who served uh, at uh, the Battle of Great Bridge. And that's where you get the uh, symbol of the snake with the uh, liberty yeah. of death, right? It... Yeah, exactly right. And then there, there are also provincial soldiers. Uh, all of the Virginia regiments started as provincial regiments. But even after the Declaration, you had state regiments, which is the same thing, just after the Declaration. Uh, and as Mark, as I recall, uh, Mercer's advance at Princeton was primarily Pennsylvania state troops. Isn't that right? Along with uh, some elements of the first Virginia and, and maybe some others. So uh, the state I mean, troops per performed very important roles. They were full-time professional state soldiers that were not supposed to normally go outside of their states. Uh, correct. I think I, I had to check about the state troops. I know there were associators uh, that but Pennsylvania had like a different system set up than many right. other colonies. Rather than a militia, they had uh, associate associators. Um, well, yeah, we should all probably also note that because it was run by Quakers, Pennsylvania had no militia before correct. the war. Yeah. So, that, so they had associators instead, which were I, how did that start, Mark? They they uh, decided that they needed a militia, so they did it on their own, or how did the associators start? Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 on the spot. I, I'm not sure how they how they originated. I think I think it was just uh, you know uh, for common defense, similar to at the militia setup. But I'm not sure who originated it or how it originally started. But they operated similar to a militia where people would join up, and right. they weren't paid soldiers, so they they operated uh, voluntarily. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, but as you mentioned, you know, these state troops, because there are Virginia state troops as well. Yeah. And yeah, the general idea is like the state troops were just for home guard. They weren't supposed to leave uh, the, the their borders. And that was also a big, you know, issue because, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden by making them continental, yeah, they're going to be like the Virginians or, you know, they're going to go fight and die up in New Jersey or New York. And a lot of people wanted to keep their troops within their, within their state boundaries. Um uh, which also led into a lot of debate, even after the victory of the war. A lot of people were wondering, you know, do we still even need a national U.S. Army? Uh, what's the purpose of having this, or is this going to go down the same route uh, that the British had? Um, which is uh, an interesting debate because we don't really, I don't think today, debate much the fact that there's a United States Army. Uh, but in the early Republic era, it was, it was hotly debated. Um, and there's actually, uh, uh, my wife used to work at a congressional cemetery in Washington, D.C., and there's a man there, Elbridge Gary, uh, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, who's buried there. Um, and, and he referred to the, uh, uh, he was very much against the idea of a standing army, uh, and he was just thought the militias could do just Lexington Concord whenever there was an issue, they didn't need a, an army. Uh, and he, he referred to a standing army uh, as a standing member. Uh, it was a symbol of domestic tranquility, uh, but was prone to foreign adventure. Um, and uh, a lot of people were fearful that, that, you know, the imperialistic qualities of having a, a standing army uh, that could go around and, and, and be outside. So I think, I think, the, I think that state troop level was like an important in between between the having a militia that was called up for um, for an emergency and a continental regiment that was enlisted and then sent anywhere within North America. I mean, this is something that haunts American history all the way up through World War II. I mean, every time we get into a war, 
it's this massive mobilization. I mean, you look at like the beginning of the Civil War, there's what, like 16, 17,000 regular troops in the US Army, obviously not enough to fight this war. We see the same thing in World War One. We see the same thing in World War Two. that kind of fear of the standing army really lasts until the Cold War, really. Um, and I mean, it's, again, not to be that guy, but the same is true in Britain. You know, we always like to say, oh, the British were the best army in the world, the biggest army in the world, the most impressive army in the world in the 18th century. I mean, I think the Prussians and the French and the Austrians would probably argue with that. I mean, the British army at the start of the American Revolution is, is minuscule by European standards. Um, and they have to go through this same effort of mobilizing enough men. And a big part of that is hiring Germans to fight for them um, to put down this rebellion. Because, I mean, they may have the greatest navy in the world, the biggest navy in the world, but their, their army is, again, that long-standing fear of a standing army. And what that can do to the civilian populace is, is deeply ingrained in their society. It was a long time going away, wasn't it? Well, guys, there's one thing we haven't really talked about really quickly, and I know we're about to wrap up, but when it comes to the American army, when it comes to the American revolutionary effort, I think we, you know, we needed both. We needed the, the highly disciplined, strong, continental, regular corps, and we also needed the emergency troops. We needed the, uh, the militia troops to come in and bolster our numbers. And to, to, uh, 100%. I mean, they 100%. worked. Yeah, it was a learning process. But absolutely, I mean, um, they complemented each other very well. Yeah, we should also probably also just note that after uh, Calpens, uh, Morgan's strategy was implemented repeatedly by by Nathaniel Green, who then yeah. took over that that theater. Right, so it was used. Yep. Or something similar to it was used at Guilford Courthouse, at Hopkirk's Hill, uh, at Utah Springs. Uh, and he, lo he lost those battles, but they were all very costly wins for the British and made room for, uh, for Yorktown eventually. Do you think uh, you could win the war with one or the other? Or did you need to have both? Yeah, you had to have the Continentals to win the war. They were the troops that stayed in the field. They were the ones who suffered at Valley Forge, withstood for three years or more fighting in the service, while many of the militia, they went home as they chose. Uh, and there were several times early in the war where we almost lost because of the militia and those short enlistments, too, when it came to the Continentals. We needed these long standing armies. I mean, look at Arnold and, and Montgomery were forced to attack Quebec because their enlistments are running out for their men, or many of them on that night around midnight at Washington. He's forced to make a move in December of 1776 because his enlistments are running out. So we needed that standing army to oppose another larger standing army as well. If we just fought a war with militia, the British could have taken their tens of thousands of men and sent them everywhere throughout the colonies to try to just punch out these little pockets of resistance. They needed to keep their army together in a concentrated position to oppose the actual standing army that we had. And vice versa, I think, I think you needed the militias uh in order for the Continentals. If you had just the Continentals, if if the Continental Army, like when Washington had just had his 3,000 guys on the opposite bank of the Delaware, if they had, uh, you know, if they, if they weren't able to mobilize these militias to make it difficult for supply lines and things like that, uh, all of a sudden, you know, these small victories for Washington, his Fabian strategy isn't gonna work so well because uh, eventually he will be hunted down and, and be surrounded and destroyed. Um, but he needed he needed these militias to to constantly come out uh, at least to help yeah win the hearts and minds of the the people in the area. I think that was a played in a crucial role as well. Yeah, I think they're both absolutely integral, and like you said, they complement each other perfectly well. The Continental Army never had the numbers to tie down all of the British forces in America. Um, but with the militia there to tie them down and and really tie down loyalists too, prevent loyalists from up rising up in any serious numbers. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that's that's crucial. Good point. All right. Any other final uh, observations? Well, I wanted I've got a question for the panel. 
are, are these coronavirus beards that you guys all have? <laughs> <laughs> I already grew one and shaved it off, and I'm on like beard number two right now. So, remain <laughs> <laughs> quarantine as well. Yeah, no, this is my coronavirus. You know, usually because I do the reenacting like Travis does. Uh, you know, you're gonna be clean shaven for that. So this is an opportunity to just let it grow. Clean. <laughs> in between gigs <laughs> all right well great well thank you all for joining me thanks everybody uh, for tuning in uh, we are going to be back here live again next weekend uh, i think we got a, a another good program we'll send out a thing uh or later this week to tell you what that topic is going to be about and, and talk a little bit more about that but thanks for tuning in and uh if you have any other questions or you want to tune in, just throw them down in the, uh, the comment section. Uh, but thanks for watching.